Good morning, Year 5, and welcome to our fourth reading lesson of the week. Earlier this week, we looked at a non-chronological report all about prisons, and we used the, develop, uh, the understanding that we developed from that text to help us to compare Spectrum Hall and prisons. And we all agreed that Spectrum Hall was not a particularly pleasant place for Kester to spend his childhood growing up. In today's lesson, we're going to continue reading The Last Wild, and in particular, we're going to be focusing on our retrieval skills. The learning objective for today's lesson is to retrieve. You need your Last Wild texts open at page 11. When I say go, I would like you to read aloud page 11 to the bottom of page 14. Once you've done that, press play and we can continue the lesson together. Go. Well done. Beautiful reading, Year 5. My turn to read aloud now. As I'm reading, I'd like you to be following the text with your finger or a pencil and be ready to respond to some of the questions that I will ask as we read the text together. Chicken and chips, announces the grey lady behind the hatch, who looks like a big door on legs with hairy arms. Today's flavour is chicken and chips. Her name is Denise, which doesn't rhyme with arms, so instead the others have made up a song about her hairy knees, which aren't actually that hairy. It doesn't matter what Denise or any of the women say though. Sausage and mash, ham and eggs, pie and peas, everything they serve looks exactly the same. Bright pink gloop that spills over the edge of the bowl and only ever tastes of one thing. Corn cocktail crisps. Which words in that part of the text give the impression that the food isn't particularly pleasant? Good. I agree. The fact that it, the word gloop is used to describe the food and the fact that it's bright pink, which is not really a colour that we normally associate with delicious food, uh, suggests that the food isn't particularly pleasant. Also, the, th the, the fact that everything they serve looks exactly the same suggests the food isn't very pleasant. Well done. What does that remind you of? Does that remind you of? Think back to uh, some of the other texts that we've read together where children have been in a kind of institution. Think about the description of the food. What does it remind you of? Great. It made me think of the same thing too. It made me think of holes and the description of the food which Stanley and the other boys at holes are forced to eat. Uh, it was watery, it wasn't very tasty, and it looked the same and tasted uh, the same. It wasn't a pleasant experience for Stanley to eat that food at all. Very similar for Kester here at Spectrum Hall. Let's continue. Formulae, they want us to call it, pronouncing the A like in day. But no one does. It's just formula. First, the animals we eat went. And then the bees went. And then the crops and fruit went. Vegetables were contaminated. Contaminated. What could contaminated mean? Think about where you might have seen the word contaminated before. Think about the context of the sentence and the sentences preceding it. Let's look at what's happening here. So the children are being forced to eat this bright pink gloop formula it says first the animals we eat went now we know from the from what we've read so far in the last world that the animals have disappeared and animals are a vital source of uh, an important source of food for many people so here the animals have gone the bees went so things like honey would go wouldn't they and then the crops and fruit went Vegetables were contaminated. So 
different food sources are going, so what could it mean vegetables were contaminated? Well done. I agree that the vegetables have gone as well. And why might that be? Perhaps contaminated could mean they became... Uh, damaged. And what was the name of the disease that we heard of in the previous chapter, which destroyed uh, the animals and many of the living things? Well done. Red eye. So it became damaged as a result of red eye. Let's continue. So there were rations. The remaining supplies of fresh food stockpiled in giant deep freezers. There's another interesting word there, isn't there? Stockpiled. Break the word stockpiled down into its two constituent parts. Well done, you should have come up with stock and pile. Stock and pile. Now stock is an amount of something like, for example, food. And to stockpile, pile literally means an amount of something, doesn't it? So stockpile, food was stockpiled, food was kept in large amounts, in giant deep freezers. Now stockpiling, you may be able to make a link between stockpiling and the behaviour of people at the beginning of the uh, first lockdown, the first lockdown due to coronavirus last March. Think about some of the images you saw in supermarkets where people were stockpiling uh, groceries and goods and <laughs> most notoriously st stockpiling toilet roll because they were worried that these kind of resources were going to run out. Then all that went too. We lived out of tins. Oily, meaty, fishy or veggie mush out of tins. Ooh. Mush sounds a bit like gloop, doesn't it? And not a very pleasant thing to have to eat. The tins began to run out too. People started eating anything, even varmints, rats, cockroaches. Then, one day, I was here by now, they just started serving us formula. And that was it. No more normal food. It's gone, Nisid had said, and it ain't coming back. That's all you need to know. Instead, we got given a meal replacement that satisfied, satisfies all your daily nutritional needs. Why do you think satisfies all your daily nutritional needs is in inverted commas? Yeah, I agree, Year 5. I think that satisfies all your daily nutritional needs is in inverted commas because that's probably what FACTO, the people that are, the, the organisation that produces this formula, have said. However, Kester obviously doesn't seem to agree that it satisfies all his daily nutritional needs. <laughs> Hence the humorous sentence which follows, if you like prawn cocktail crisps. James, do you want feeding or a crack on that dumb skull of yours? Harry Denise empties a ladle of pink slop into my bowl, and I walk back past the others, already stuffing their faces where they stand. Big, Bre Big Brenda smiles at me as I pass, and so I stop. She's all right, Bren. Perhaps because people laugh at her all the time for being fat, she doesn't laugh at other people so much. All right, Dumbinger, she says, putting away half of her formula dose in a single spoon, spoonful. Dumb and ginger. I'm a gift for a nickname, I am. I shrug and stir the formula around in my bowl. Then there's a head full of spiky hair in my face, and Maze is leering up at me. Hello, Dumbinger. What's the chat? I avoid his gaze and look down at the pink loop. Bit quiet, is it? he says. Leave him alone, says Bren, her mouth full of chicken and chips. But he doesn't. Nah. He's only pretending, aren't you, Dumbinger? I shake my head, already resigned to what happens next. 
Mays puts his bowl down and rolls his sleeves up. Look, Bren, I'll show you. I bet if I give Dominja a dead arm, he'll scream his little head off. Won't you, Dominja? No, I won't. A, because I can't. And B, I'm not in the mood for this today. So, holding my bowl close to my chest, like a shield, I press past him and the others. I hear Maze spit with disgust on the ground behind me and laugh, even though it's the worst thing to do. It's impossible not to. I turn back round. They're all just staring at me. Freak, says Maze, and flashes his little devil grin. I have to remember that I gave up trying to be like the talkers a long time ago. So, shaking my head, trying to pretend like it doesn't matter, playing the big man, I turn back and take the bowl to go and sit in my corner. My corner isn't really my corner, of course. It's just a part of the yard, underneath one of the metal walkways between classrooms, where there's more metal and concrete than glass. Where they pile up the empty, empty formula kegs from the kitchen next to a drain. A quiet and dark place, somewhere good to go if you don't want to be bothered by spiky-haired idiots. I put the bowl of fluorescent pink down on the ground and turn one of the kegs over. Factorium is a Selwyn Stone enterprise, it has engraved on the bottom. Whatever. No one's ever seen Selwyn Stone for real. He probably doesn't even exist. It's hard to see people when they're always behind a smoked glass car window or disappearing into a skyscraper surrounded by crowds of photographers and bodyguards. The head of Facto, the man who invented formula. The head of the whole island now, the man who made up all of the rules. Don't touch this. Don't eat that. Don't live here. Well, right now, I don't care for his stupid rules. And to prove it, I sit right down on top of his stupid name, pick up my bowl and wait. You see, I'm not going to eat it myself. Well, maybe a bit, but it is properly foul. I'm going to give it to someone else. Someone who should be here right about now. And sure enough, there, on the edge of the shadows by the drain, I can just see two antennae poking out, curling and tasting the air. Two orangey-red antennae, belonging to an insect about the length of my thumb. An insect with a flat head, lots of bristly legs, and, silently chewing at the front, a pair of jaws. Another varmint. A cockroach. Now that we have read the text together, I'm going to show you how to use the retrieval toolkit to respond to retrieval questions on the text. Then we're going to respond to a retrieval question together. Finally, you're going to show me that you're ready for your independent application by answering a retrieval question independently. So, my turn. The first thing that I need to do is I need to read the question, identify what I'm looking for, and underline any keywords in the question. So, what do we learn about Selwyn Stone? Page 14. What do we learn, so something new, about Selwyn Stone? page 14. Okay, well, helpfully, I've been told that I need to look on page 14, so I'm now going to skim the topic sentences of each paragraph to see which paragraph is likely to contain the key words. Okay, now, this, sentence, this paragraph obviously starts on the previous page. I'm just going to read the sentence, see if it's likely to contain anything about Selwyn Stone. No, okay, the next topic sentence. Factorium is... This? Ah! Here we go. Selwyn Stone. So I've now located the paragraph where my uh, information is likely to be included. So I'm going to now read this paragraph in greater detail. I've located the paragraph. I've found the word. I'm going to read this paragraph in greater detail. So... It says, Factorium is a Selwyn Stone enterprise. It has engraved on the bottom. Whatever. No one's ever seen Selwyn Stone for real. Now I'm going to underline or highlight anything that it tells me about Selwyn Stone within this paragraph so I can then go back 
and respond to the question, what do we learn about Selwyn Stone? He probably doesn't even exist. He. So Selwyn Stone must be a person because the pronoun he is used to refer to Selwyn Stone. It's hard to see people when they're always behind a smoked glass car window or disappearing into a skyscraper surrounded by crowds of photographers and bodyguards. The head of facto, the man who invented formula. Okay, so I know that Selwyn Stone must be the head of facto, the man who invented formula. But there are many other things that I learned within this paragraph as well. For example, the fact that he's very shady, isn't he? He's difficult to... not. Not very many people see him. It says he's, it's hard to see people when they're always behind a smoked glass car window or disappearing into a skyscraper surrounded by crowds of photographers and bodyguards. Let's carry on. The head of the whole island now, the man who made up all the new rules. Don't touch this, don't do that, don't live here. Well, right now. Okay. So, I've got enough information to be able to respond to the question. So, I'm going to take my home learning book and have a go at recording the information in the text as a response to this retrieval question. So, once I've written my date now, question one. We learn that Selwyn Stone, making sure that I spell it correctly because it is in the text in front of me, we learn that Selwyn Stone is the head of facto the man who invented formula. And those words are copied directly from the text. He is also a very shady character. He is a very shady character. And then I'm going to copy directly from the text. No one ever really sees him. No one ever really sees him. Because he is always behind. He is always behind. And again, this comes directly from the text. A smoked glass car window. Smoked glass car window. Or disappearing into a skyscraper or disappearing into a skyscraper. Okay, I'm going to reread my answer to check that I've contained all the relevant information, all the things that we learn about Selwyn Stone on page 14. We learn that Selwyn Stone is the head of facto, the man who invented formula. He is a very shady character. No one ever really sees him because he is always behind a smoked glass car window or disappearing into a skyscraper. Good. I'm happy that I've uh, answered the question accurately. Let's have a go at answering this question together. Read the question aloud. Well done. Beautiful reading. Why does Kester think his corner is a good place to be on the yard? Now we've read the question aloud, I'd like you to underline the key words in the question. Go. Well done. Key words in the question include Kester, think his corner is a good place to be on the yard. 
and we know that we're looking on page 14. Okay. Kester actually begins talking about his corner on page 13. So what I would like you to do is to identify any evidence anywhere it mentions the yard and in particular Kester's corner. When you've done that, underline the evidence. Check to see if the evidence that you've underlined is relevant and helps you to answer the question. Pause the video to do that. When you're ready to continue with the lesson and check your evidence, press play. Off you go. Let's compare. So, I underlined, I, I firstly noticed that Kester referred to his corner here. I take back, uh, I turn back and take the bowl to go and sit in my corner. My corner isn't really my corner, of course. It's just a part of the yard underneath one of the metal walkways between classrooms where there's more metal and concrete than glass, where they pile up the empty formula, kegs from the kitchen next to a drain, a quiet and dark place, somewhere good to go if you don't want to be bothered by spiky-haired idiots. Okay. Which parts of the evidence that we just underlined helped us to answer this question? Well done. The fact that it's a quiet and dark place. Somewhere good to go if you don't want to be bothered by spiky haired idiots. So, pause the video whilst you write down your response to this question. Then press play. Go. If your answer read something like this, Kester thinks his corner is a good place to be on the yard because it is a quiet and dark place, somewhere good to go if you don't want to be bothered by spiky haired idiots, then well done, you retrieved effectively from the text. Let's have a look at another example before it's your turn to do the independent application. Okay, year five, time to show me that you're ready to begin the independent application. In order to do that, I'd like you to answer this question independently. Once you've done that, press play to check your answer. Off you go. OK, let's check the process that you used to help you to answer this question and see if you were correct. So you followed the toolkit and you've read the question, identifying that the keywords are why, so you're looking for an explanation, where rations introduced, and we're going to be looking on page 11 and 12. So, I'm going to scan the text to see if I can find the word rations on page 11 and 12. Here it is, rations. Now I've found the key word, I'm going to read the sentence, the previous sentence, and the following sentence to see if that provides me with the evidence I need to answer the question. It says, so there were rations. Uh, well, straight away, there's a really good clue. The fact that the authors use the conjunction so suggests that the explanation, the reason, which is, of course, what I'm looking for, must come before the word rations, must come before what I've just read. So I'm now going to start actually reading from the beginning of the paragraph because I think the relevant evidence might be included within this paragraph. Formulae, they want us to call it, pronouncing the A like in day, but no one does. It's just formula. First the animals we eat went, and then the bees went, and then the crops and fruit went. Vegetables were contaminated, so there were rations. The remaining supplies of... OK, good. I'm happy that my explanation is there. So rations were introduced because the animals we eat went, the bees went, then the crops and fruit went. Vegetables became contaminated, so there were rations. That is the correct answer to this question. Now you've shown me that you're able to do that year five, I'd like you to use this retrieval toolkit to help you to answer the retrieval questions in your work pack and on Seesaw. Remember to submit your work onto Seesaw for your teachers to mark. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you produce.